I had the great privilege of reading Ed's book last night, and I guess maybe because of Wordle, I'm thinking in terms of five letter words with all the right letters and consonants. And Ed's book is really a feast. It's just an extra, absolutely extraordinary document um, about our era and really the, the last, as he says, 70 years or even before, because, la because he's a great, in addition to being a commentator, he's also a scholar and he's not afraid to dig in and research um, old topics and new. And, and uh, I just, I was astonished as I turned the pages. It's just one, one delight after another. Um, Ed says at the beginning of the book that one of the reasons for his writing it is to, is to spare, spare the works, some of his works, a few of his works from oblivion that await most protest art and magazine illustration. And I think that Ed is really very modest. There's very little danger that Ed Sorrell's work is ever going to disappear. It's the chronicle of our era, as I say, and the blurb that he has that he got from E.L. Doctorow, who called him our Daumier, our Thomas Nast, um, is really just about on target. Um, Tina Brown also had it right. She said, of course, he's a genius. And uh, it's hard to top that. that. That summarizes things about as well as anybody ever could. Um, I just wanted to start, Ed, by asking you, who did you most relish drawing in all of the years that you've done it, apart from Edward G. Robinson? Now, you say that that were you, a, were you a pharaoh, you would want to be buried with your caricature of Edward G. Robinson because you think that's like the greatest one that you ever did. And I won't argue with you about that. I mean, obviously, you're very tied to Hollywood, too. But I wonder who you most relish drawing and who was the hardest for you to draw? The hardest is easy. The hardest was William Rogers, who was Secretary of State for... I think Nixon, and uh, he got pushed out by by Kissinger. The easiest one is 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 every cartoonist's joy is Richard Nixon. You, uh, the most untalented caricaturist, could do Richard Nixon. It was he was too easy, uh, and he and he was despicable. So that made it wonderful. There are all of the Nixon caricatures in there, but another person that you seem to relish going after was Condoleezza Rice. There's a lot of her. Tell me about that. I got a lot of assignments from Vanity Fair uh, to do the Bushies, and uh, and she was easy to draw, and she. Um, I didn't have any particular hatred for, for Condoleezza. She was easy to draw. I mean, another oh, the person, the, if, if, I were, if I were George Gross or, or William Gropper or any of the German expressionists, the person I would have liked to have done was, was, uh, was of course, Trump, but also Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, I think, did more harm to this country than even Donald Trump. Donald Trump clearly was the biggest fascist threat to this country. Uh, Ronald Reagan was not that, but the terrible things he did were beyond anybody, certainly beyond Nixon. And Well, Nixon, of course, you know, everybody's trying to prove that Nixon is yeah. was really a liberal but actually the truth is that he had a democratic uh congress uh, a democratic senate and a democratic house of representatives to contend with and that's why he didn't do as much harm as he could have i want to get back to trump for a second because you have an interesting discussion in the book about him and you list, I, I put down five reasons you give for not going after him in the way that you did Nixon and Reagan. 
You said one, one, which is interesting to me, is that it sounded as if you despaired of the effectiveness of caricature and the work that you were doing after, after doing it for so many years that you wondered whether it made any difference. And it sounded as if, in a way, you were too discouraged to go after him. That was one reason. Um, and, the, and that your sense of outrage was sort of almost exhausted by the time Trump came along, maybe by people like Nixon and Reagan, and that you felt that in some way your style was inadequate for Trump, that Trump was so awful that your style wasn't up to it. Um, then you mentioned about Dix and Grosch and the German expressionists who had more venom than you. And you didn't have the venom necessary for Trump. And that Trump was such a, a menace to democracy that you couldn't make fun of him. He was too serious a menace for you to go after in the way that you normally did with these other ridiculous figures. Can you expand on any of that? Well, first of all, uh, there, were, there were plenty of Germans artists who were able to take on Hitler and find a way to ridicule him. And, uh, and it wasn't, it wasn't that I, uh, I thought I was, I realized that I couldn't make a difference. I always knew that I couldn't make a difference. Uh, I don't think anybody ever made a difference except with the possible exception of Thomas Nast, who had a whole newspaper behind him. I mean, his drawings were appearing with the editorial on the editorial page of the Times. So um, uh, maybe he made a difference, but uh, people like Jules Pfeiffer and I know that, uh, that nobody's going to listen to us. Nobody listened, nobody listened to five marches against the war in Vietnam. Uh, you, you sometimes, you simply don't, can't make a difference. Uh, the reason I didn't do Trump was, was really because I was working on, on other things. I was working on the book. I was doing my first grown-up book. I was doing the book on Mary Astor. And I didn't want, uh, I wasn't going to sacrifice that book to to Trump. That was part of it. It was pure selfishness on my part, and I I didn't think it would it would do any good. And I didn't know Barry Blitt knew how to be wonderfully funny about Trump. Those covers he did for the New Yorker was so brilliant that I stopped doing covers for the New Yorker. I really felt I couldn't compete with him. He was uh, I didn't know how to be funny about Trump. Uh, I, I couldn't understand. I mean, he was so transparently a fraud. I, I couldn't understand how, well, I, I do know about Lumpen proletariat, so I did understand why so many people loved him. It, it was their vengeance on, on the overeducated and, and, and those Eastern establishment people. Uh, that's why they love him because he's because he hates them as much as he hates the, he hates Jews and blacks as much as they do. So I I I can't I can't be uh, articulate about why I didn't do Trump because uh, I do feel a little guilty about it. But are there instances where you know you got under the skin of the people you were skewering? I'll give you an example of how powerless we all are to do. And I forget the year, but it must have been before Goldwater ran for president. And uh, I did a series of uh, monuments for our time for Horizon magazine. And one of them, one of the monuments was of, was of uh, Goldwater sitting on a horse, one of, an equestrian statue, and he's sitting on the horse backwards and uh, facing, the, facing the back, and, and he's wearing some Middle Ages costume of war, 
And uh, I thought it was devastating, uh, but I got a phone call after it appeared from the editors at Horizon saying that Barry Goldwater wants to buy it. I wasn't going to give it to him under any circumstances, but, uh, but the, the editor explained to me, you don't understand, Ed. Uh, Barry is the, is the head of the Postal Committee, and we are a hardcover magazine. And if Mr. Goldwater decides that we are a book instead of a magazine, we're out of business. I said, well, I'm sorry to see you go, but I'm not giving it to him. And they somehow soft-pedaled the issue, and I never gave it to him. And uh, I forget what friend I gave it to. But uh, anyway, that's just an example of you're not hurting them. They're, They're not afraid of you. And the only the only comfort the the political cartoonist has is that it reassures the people out there who think exactly the way he does that uh, that there's somebody else out there who feels that way. They're not alone. That's the only thing that the political cartoonist does. Well, that's an indication of how good your book is that, that you couldn't even squeeze that story in there. I mean, that's 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 one that's not in the book. Uh, one story that's in the book is that you write about a cartoon that you did of Nixon talking to B.B. Rebozo and having this very sexual conversation, the two of them sort of in, in flagrante, and that the National Portrait Gallery bought this cartoon from you but they were, but they were afraid to hang it, and I gather never did. That's one story that you tell, and you also tell the story about doing a cartoon of Cardinal Spellman as a warmonger that was so offensive that you couldn't even convince Ramparts, The Nation, and New York Magazine to print it. It was too much uh, for for any of them. I wonder if there are if there are other instances of censorship you know, where even you went too far and you couldn't get things published. Well, you, you didn't mention that the outrageous cartoon of uh, Nixon, uh, the, the picture is of Judge Sirica listening to the tape and the tape is... Uh, oh, Sirica, right, yeah. Sirica, and uh, that one balloon from the tape has, uh, has one voice saying... Oh, oh, Bibi, you're you're so big, Bibi. Oh, Bibi, it's clearly he's being buggered. And uh, the next balloon, the short balloon, is thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, It was an outrageous cartoon, but it was done because my friend Steve Heller, who was art director of Screw newspaper. Uh, Screw came out every week with uh, pornographic photographs. And uh, and I, since I'm not good at drawing naked people, I drew my cartoon of Sirica listening to tapes. But uh, that's why I, I had to do something outrageous for Screw. David, can we look at the uh... Cardinal Spellman, was it? Uh, Cardinal, well, I can, if you give me a minute, I'll find it. Um, uh, and I, maybe I'll find B.B. Rebozo and Nixon, too. <laughs> you know, you turn the page and there's just one fantastic thing after another. The book is, the book is terrific. And uh, I look at it and I, I can't believe I'm as good as the stuff in there. But uh, I, I did some good ones. Uh, this is one of my favorite. Uh, this is one of my favorite cartoons. This is uh, this is uh, 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 that, that's Reagan uh, as Robin Hood shaking down the poor so that the for the rich. But, uh, I don't know. Uh, I can find the Bieber Rabozo one in a second. I mean, this is one of the this is one of the Condi Rice ones. Can you see it? I can't. <laughs> Yes. This is the cover of Screw Magazine. <laughs> I didn't. Re- I didn't realize that Milton Glaser did the phallus in that. In, in the phallus well, in Screw, he he designed 
he designed uh, the the logo, the masthead. Yeah. And uh, he's the one who gave the E uh, a, an erection. Right. Yeah. Uh, but in fact, I mean, you you worked for everybody. I mean, did you were, were there were there publications for whom you would not work? Yes, I, I, I turned down uh, William Buckley's magazine, of National Review, yeah. But the interesting thing, did, 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 did I also Buckley... turned down Time magazine when they wanted me to do a cover about how the press was persecuting Nixon. The Republican Party was always the Republican Party. It didn't ha suddenly happen, but there was an element of fascism there for as long as I can remember. Is this this the one that you want to be buried? buried yeah, with? that's the one I wanted to be buried with, yeah. Actually, the question there is, I mean, you, there's almost as much Hollywood in a way. There's a lot of Hollywood in what you do. And I wonder about what, what the interplay was in your life between Hollywood and politics and politicians. Hollywood had a contract system. So when you went to the movies on Saturday matinee, you always saw the same supporting players over and over. And they became my family and they became, and they were much more entertaining than my family. And so I started reading movie reviews. I became a, uh, a movie nut. I, I, loved, I loved knowing everything about these supporting players. <laughs> and... Um, and I stayed interested in movies for a long time. I lost interest in baseball rather early, and I lost <laughs> interest in movies, I would say, in the last 10 years. It was just, uh, it's not that I missed the happy endings. I, I just, well, very often I could not understand the movies anymore. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know why, but I, I've, sort of lost interest. Wait, I mean, one more question. You have, you've had an interesting relationship over the decades with the New Yorker and ups and downs with the New Yorker. Can you tell us about that? There really weren't any downs. Uh, I, I got on well with all the editors. Tina Brown made me nervous because she was too glamorous. She was very good to me and, and, and uh, very generous. Well, there's an incredible run in, in the book of, of covers for The New Yorker, and it really takes your breath away when you just you keep turning one page after another. I mean, there was a period there in the 90s when you were in there all the time on the cover. And, that and was Tina Brown's. Yeah, Brown's. yeah, just just da just dazzling. Anyway, Michael, I, I have just one more question at the end. I have here. Uh, I, I took a bunch of uh, Ed's books out of the library. And uh, I have here Super Pan, which was uh, cartoons and caricatures uh, from uh, published in 1978. And uh, right at the, the first illustration in it is my favorite Nixon, Millhouse One. It, it is it is tough. <laughs> this 1978 book is is full of Nixon and Gerald Ford uh, illustrations. Um, do you have any recollections about this particular book? I do. Random House came to me. I didn't think I was good enough to do a book of cartoons. Uh, they asked me to do it. and uh, So this was the first one? No, I did, I did another one earlier that, uh, that for some publisher in Chicago. It was mm -hmm. Swallow Press. Uh, but mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to do another book. The drawings there aren't very good. I, I was... It took me a long time to draw well. I became very, very good, but it took me a long time. I was in my late 40s before I did drawings that I liked. It wasn't until the 90s that I became an, the artist that I wanted to become. I, I had to steal from a lot of artists before I became good. I think for us consumers of your art uh, over the years, uh, the message was more important than than, than the uh, than the skill. Absolutely, the, yeah. yeah. I had uh, great ideas, 
I didn't know how to do. We, we were so pleased when you skewered people like like Nixon and and other people that we hated. And also, as you say, it was so easy to draw Nixon. You know, there was there was no question. You know. Uh, uh, who you were skewering at any time. Well, Ed, you, you actually have an interesting description of that in your book, because you talk about how your art education really destroyed the artist in you, and that you were swimming against the tide for doing representational stuff when everybody wanted abstractions, and that you had to, un you, they made you unlearn what your in innate yeah. sense of art, I, I and was, you had to recover it. I was a very promising nine-year-old. I went to Cooper Union because it was free. Sure My parents you. could afford free. They were caught up in the, uh, uh, the Bauhaus design, design, design. All they wanted was design, and they wanted, they wanted it flat. And so for three years, I was drummed into doing these terrible, terrible drawings. A bowl of fruit had to be flat and designed. And it didn't matter whether you drew a locomotive or an orange or anything. It was always, it was always abstracted. And I did it because I was a good boy and I wanted, I didn't want to get kicked out of school. Uh, but what saved me, I went into... Seymour Quast and I got fired on the same day from Esquire. And, uh, and I talked him into starting a studio that we called Pushpin. And then Milton came back from his Fulbright in Italy and he joined us. We became so successful that I was able to stop being the salesman for the studio and I was allowed to make pictures. I relearned how to draw from Seymour and Milton Glaser. I'm still indebted to them. I've really enjoyed my life. I've, I've enjoyed, I mean, to be able to, uh, to have a family and send them to, send four kids to college without taking loans uh, by making funny pictures is a great accomplishment. I'm, uh, I'm very grateful to them. The book is very modest and you, you beat yourself up a little bit in the book, but isn't it, isn't it really true that you helped resurrect this whole tradition of cartooning and, and caricatures that went back centuries and you and David Levine and people like you, a small handful of people helped resurrect this whole tradition. David and I stole from the same artists, 19th century artists. So uh, he stole from Gillot, who was a French cartoonist who did big heads and small bodies. And uh, I stole from everybody. That's what, I mean, if you don't have a really solid foundation in drawing, which I don't, uh, you you plagiarize from others from and uh, and to good effect. I mean, I uh, you have no idea how good David Levine was. I mean, uh, you his drawings were uh, they're magnificent. I mean, his non caricature drawings. He was a a, 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 a superb draftsman and and uh, he never. He never got the appreciation he deserved because the art critics are only interested in something new. And David is, a, is an offshoot of Constable and various other 19th century painters, a world that is only interested in, in outrageous things like uh, Rothko and Jackson Pollock. I do love modern art, if it's Max Beckman or Alice Neal. I would love to have been either Alice Neal or Beckman, but uh, there's a lot of modern art that still seems to me to be utter trash. And I, I don't understand, I don't understand what it's doing in the Metropolitan. Uh, so uh, in, in a way, I'm just a, a, a silly old man that way.
you're not a fan of Rothko, Pollock, and no. uh, and the abstract no. impressionists. No. One thing that you say, I mean, you actually say in the book that at the beginning, when you were sending around your stuff, you put in other pieces work. I mean, you weren't just plagiarizing, you actually ripped them off. You'd put them in your own book. I, I was a crook. Right. You were a, cro <laughs> you, you were a crook. And that, that seems to me one shortcoming of the book, I think, is that you don't explain how you managed to get so good. By plagiarizing. No, no, no. It's obviously you went well beyond all of that, and but you almost had to teach yourself. If I had gotten different teachers, different schools, I could have gotten very good earlier, but I was determined to get good. It helps to have good taste. When I was teaching, trying to teach students how to do children's book, how to do decorative illustrations, how to do different kinds of illustration where they might be able to make a living. Uh, what I found was that a lot of them wanted to be Jack Davis. They didn't want to be David Levine. They, want, they had poor taste. I had terrific taste. I just didn't have the ability that's yet. But uh, so uh, I finally got good. What, what is that you're working on behind you, that, the drawing on the table? Oh, uh, I swore to myself about a, a year ago that I was never going to take any more assignments because they break your heart. And uh, I, just, I just wanted to do my own stuff. But uh, Robert Weil, who is the editor of Liverite Books, which is a uh, an imprint of W.W. W. Norton uh, sent me a book by Martin Sharon and it was it's called Big Red and it's a, a novel about the marriage of yes. Rita Hayworth and Orson Welles and I love the novel so I decided so I agreed to do the book and it's uh, breaking my heart because I, I, I can I can do I've reached the point where I have a hard time doing assignments. Uh, I, I can do stuff that I think of that are my ideas. I know how to do them, yep. but I don't know how to do everything. The introduction to the book was by Graydon Carter, uh, who owns the Waverly Inn. I believe he still owns the Waverly Inn. Am I right? Yeah. And uh, when he commissioned you to do this work, uh, you you said you were uh, uh, behind on a number of projects, uh, but the, the challenge and the magnitude of the mural had him in its grip. He now says that he was willing and cheery during our nine month collaboration. I would never quibble with his talent or his dedication, nor would any editor he has worked with, but willing and cheery he is not. He is a raffish throwback to a time when editorial disagreements were settled over fifths or fists. Ed is also as handsome and dashing as a matinee idol, better read than any writer or editor he works with and in full command of a dry manner and a piercing wit. My instructions were from the architect, the instructions were, I want it to look as though it has a hundred years of tobacco smoke on it. Uh, the instructions from Graydon were simply where you, I want you to do a mural with all the people that lived in the village. Uh, that was wonderful. So he made a list and I made a list. And uh, one of the people on my list was, um, was, the, was the, the communist cartoonist. Uh, Art Young. Art Young, yeah, 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 Art Young. Art Young. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Art Young. So, uh, Graydon, who is Canadian, didn't know who Art Young was. And, uh, and I lied to him. I said, uh, every American knows who Art Young is, uh, which, of course, isn't true. But, uh, but he did agree to let me do Art Young. Before I started to do the mural, he said, um, but you'll 
put me in the mural, of course. I said, you bet, sure. Uh, and so I put him in the mural as a bird w holding a martini glass because he was very proud of the martini that the Waverly Inn was going to do. And, uh, and then when he saw himself, he, saw, he decided, no, you, you can't do that. So I turned, him, I turned it into a writer. Oh, by the way, this, this, this little book on the mural, uh, it, it shows the individual uh, um, uh, portraits yes. of, of the people. And, and each one is, uh, has a little bit of text by Dorothy Gallagher. Gallagher is a friend, yeah. And it's, and it's wonderful. She is yes, so, she's a terrific so, writer. Yeah. so witty, so yeah. sharp. She's a very good, serious writer. She's won several literary prizes. I didn't think of Graydon having you paint over himself as an example of censorship, but there's another <laughs> one. You, he pulled no, the by the way, uh, of all, uh, Graydon, of all the people, all the editors I work for, and I've liked a lot of them, uh, Graydon was by far the most generous and jolly person to work for. Uh, I, I've been very lucky with, uh, with the editors. I loved reading Graydon's uh, little columns in Vanity Fair on, on the various politicians that you also hated. Oh, yes. Well, he's a, he's a, and he's a very good writer. He is. Uh, I know he's writing his memoir now, and, uh, and I... And it'll be terrific. His his columns on at the front of Vanity Fair on Trump, you know, for a couple of years were were just amazing. This is one of your favorite projects. I'll, yes, I'll tell that was the book that on I uses as an excuse for not going after Trump during right. his four years. I'll, I'll tell the audience the story in it for a minute here in case they haven't read the book, uh, which is that you you rent an apartment in 1965 and it was a dump and you tore up the linoleum on the floor to replace it, found a bunch of old newspapers under the floor, uh, which described the, the great Mary Astor sex scandal of 1936, you know. Uh, you got very interested in that and followed it uh, for decades, um, all the while intending to, uh, well, to write a book or to, to do something with all of this interesting information about Mary Astor and the sex scandal. And finally, you did it in 2016, which is uh, a, a little while after 1936 and 1965. Yeah. Uh, well, I knew it was now or never. I was in my, my 80s. And, uh, uh, so tell yeah, us about she, your love affair was, with Mary. She wrote a, she wrote a memoir. Uh, she wrote a story about her life. And uh, it was, um, she's a terrific writer. She was a very good writer. Unfortunately, she was also an alcoholic. Uh, uh, but I, first of all, I thought she was the most beautiful woman in the world. And um, when I, I I saw her when I was ten years old in the Prisoner of Zenda, and I I I just couldn't believe anybody could be that beautiful, so um, so I decided uh, to do uh, her biography, and to sneak in my biography as well. So I I was able to sell it as as a biography written by a poor, lovesick old man for a 1930s actress. I was really not quite as uh, obsessed with her as I pretended to be, but, uh, <laughs> but it was great fun working on it. And here's uh, the, the, the opening spread. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, and and yeah. Graydon Carter ran that drawing as a, as a double page spread in Vanity Fair. And the various episodes in Mary's life are, are illustrated, you know, including her many marriages. She, she married awful men. And uh, some women just do that. They marry terrible, terrible people. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't know, uh, I don't know why they do that. Uh, 
when when there are nice guys like me around. I mean, somebody is writing a musical now. Someone bought the rights to my Mary Astor book, and he's writing a musical in which Mary Astor and I fall in love. <laughs> uh, don't ask me how he's going to do it, but I've heard some of the songs, and they're pretty good. When is this coming to Broadway? No, it will never come to Broadway. If we're, if I'm lucky, it'll come to off Broadway. But uh, uh, he, I think he's doing it with maybe three or four actors. Hey, uh, Ed, could I ask you a question about this about this book? I I think that one of the things that makes it so magnificent is the paper it's printed on is a huge, just tremendous quality. Absolutely. The reproductions of your uh, drawings and cartoons are magnificent. And I'm wondering if, besides the book, and like Mary Astor book and this book, could you have a career today? Because magazines, by and large, are gone, and people don't read print pretty... I, I think people read mostly off screens instead of wonderful paper like this. No. Could you have a career today if you were just starting uh, out? No. Uh, I, if I was starting out now, I'd uh, realize that I was in the wrong profession and go try to do something else. There is no way to make a living anymore. The, the last cartoonist, I mean, there's, uh, there are a few guys left who do New Yorker covers that are okay. One is John Cuneo is one, Barry Blitt is another, and Ed Corrin is still still knocking out terrific work. But there's no way, print is gone, uh, really. And the kind of work that I do is uh, already looks kind of 19th century. Uh, there, there's a marvelous uh, a car cartoonist called... Uh, Steve Brodner, wonderful, wonderful guy, and uh, no, nobody better. But there's no, there's no more work for him. Uh, he he teaches. He has to teach to get by, and his stuff does appear in uh, occasionally in the Washington Post, occasionally in the, rarely in the New Yorker. I can't uh, can't figure out why they don't use him more often. But no, in answer to your question, no, there isn't, there isn't any way for me to, to succeed now. Have, have you ever done computer art? Have you tried? Uh, I don't want to do it. I mean, what's the fun in doing something mechanical? Uh, I mean, I, every, I, I, did, I did one drawing that needed work. And I and my son, who is a whiz at this, was able to put a a flat color into the drawing and save it. But I I don't want to be able to do that stuff. Or I, mean, any I love I love some of the uh, computer art. It's interesting, and a lot of it is beautiful. Are any of your children artists? One of my my oldest daughter is. Uh, who is a, teaches design at a junior college. Uh, she does beautiful, beautiful stuff, but uh, it's sweet. It isn't, it isn't, she, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't hate anybody. There's a cartoon in the book. I think it's an early cartoon that you did um, where you talk, you have different panels and you review how all these great artists, Degas, Matisse, Gauguin, Picasso, were all shits. They're all terrible people who were awful to their kids and awful to their wives and awful to other people. And Tolstoy is in the mix too, but not in that particular cartoon. And you conclude in that cartoon that you were, that you were too nice a guy to be a great artist. And I wonder on the spectrum between nice guy and great artist, looking back on all the stuff that you've that you've done and can and continue to do where you'd place yourself. Well, I certainly don't place myself very high in the nice guy category. I've done I've done selfish things in my life. Uh, 
but uh, I, I'm for the 20th century and even for the, for the tw 21st century, I, I rate myself very highly as a cartoonist, as a caricaturist. But, uh, and I would like more people to regard comic art as an art. And uh, I mean, uh, so I, 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 as I said before, I, I did become the artist I hoped to become. And, uh, and now I'm famous enough to be modest. I remember, I, I remember when I, in my very first book, which was called Making the World Safer Hypocrisy for a small publisher in Chicago. And they, he sent me on a television tour to promote the book. And I was my usual modest self, uh, not good enough, uh, the drawing isn't so good. I don't know why I have to share this thing with, with, uh, with an audience. So as I came off, the, the next guy who, who wrote a book and was going to promote it, he says, you know, kid, you're not famous enough to be modest. <laughs> 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 so, well, now I'm famous enough to be modest. <laughs> famous indeed, and it's so marvelous that you continue to publish. Um, and um, we'll let you, uh, we'll give you a rest. And uh, thank you so much, Ed, for, for agreeing to talk to us. And uh, uh, onward uh, to talking to Tony. You know, that was great. That, that was great, Ed. Who hopefully I'm, going, I'm going to take that drug, that the, the pill that they have for memory. So if we do this again, I'm sure I'll do better on the names. Well, you've done a bunch of them, haven't you? You did the Philadelphia uh, uh, Museum uh, or library. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to do Tony uh, in, in a week. And... Uh, I hope I'll remember the names then. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank that was you just audience. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.